Hello, everyone. Uh, since we missed two hours of class on October 2nd, uh, due to the holiday, I'm recording these sessions uh, to help us stay on track with the curriculum and ensure that we complete everything as scheduled. So if you have any questions, uh, online students or in-person students, uh, please feel free to post it in the Google Classrooms and I will answer them. And for the e-learning students, please post your questions in the discussion page and I will answer them as well. So let's pick up uh, right from where we left off uh, last uh, Wednesday. So last Wednesday, we were studying Chapter 9, uh, the Kingdom uh, Government, and we were looking at how you and I must relate to the civil government. So the Kingdom of God, I said, is slightly different in our world, regardless of the form of government we have. So whether whatever, you know, the form of government, whether it is democracy or uh, any other form of government, you know, I want us to understand a few things. Now, the first one is that God is able to work uh, in spite of who is in uh, authority or which government is in authority. He is able to get his purposes accomplished. Uh, so that is the first thing. The second one is that we as people in, in our nation, under that government, we have a responsibility, uh, you know, to whatever extent uh, to use our rights uh, or our you know, whatever extent uh, the uh, our rights allows us or permits us uh, to vote or to pray for the right people to come into authority. Well, that is our um, responsibility. So every nation re receives the government it deserves. So what we have today is what we deserve. Either we have prayed for it or we did not pray for it, or whether we voted for it or we did not vote for it. So we got what we deserve. We have the fruit of our own efforts. So we as people of the kingdom of God, we must ensure that we invest our time, the F our effort and pray and, uh, you know, whatever rights we have in our nations to make sure that we bring in the right people, the right government. Uh, look at what Proverbs chapter 29 verse 2 says. It says that when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. So we have a responsibility to bring the right people into our government. But regardless of who is in the government, God is able to bring his influence to them. Uh, I'd like to just give you an example. Now, you know, when Jesus was brought before Pilate uh, uh, in John chapter 19, uh, verses 10 and 11, Pilate said this to Jesus, do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and power to release you? Okay, so uh, how did Jesus respond to that? Jesus says in verse 11, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Okay, so one thing I can, you know, uh, uh, we can learn from uh, this is that, you know, uh, yes, Pilate was in authority, uh, but Jesus says that, you know, no power can be given to you against me unless it has been given to you from uh, above. So I believe that, you know, uh, we must learn to look at our government in the same manner. And we, when we look at them and say that, you know, uh, when we look at our government and say God has allowed this, then, you know, it uh, also puts us in a place where we are able to uh, submit to those who are in authority, uh, you know, submit to the leadership in our civil government and also pray for those who are in um, authority. Another scripture verse that we can look at is in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. It says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like rivers of water, and he turns it wherever he wishes. So the king's heart, the heart of the ruler, the heart of the governor, the heart of the person in authority is in the hand of God regardless of who he is. Okay, 
So it, it, that does not matter. God can influence him. God can change him. God can uh, use him to fulfill his plans and his uh, purposes. Uh, let's look at uh, uh, two or three examples from uh, scripture. The first one is uh, Pharaoh, uh, the king of Egypt. Uh, you know, uh, 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 we read in Exodus that uh, uh, his heart was so hardened, uh, but that was okay for God, you know, in spite of his heart being, uh, being hardened and he was rebellious and stubborn. Uh, but, you know, God demonstrated more and more miracles until his people were so absolutely convinced that they must follow this God who is doing all of these amazing uh, miracles. So when God told them the night that they were supposed to leave, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 Egypt, you know, uh, and he tells, God tells them, now pack and leave. They did not ask any questions. They just packed and left. So we see how God even turned, uh, you know, around the situation that was there, even though Pharaoh's heart was hardened, how he turned it around and used it for his um, advantage. Now think about Nehemiah, okay? Uh, Nehemiah was uh, serving as a cupbearer to a Persian king, and this was an unsaved king. And when Nehemiah, you know, uh, told uh, the king that he wanted to go back uh, to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, you know, what did this unsaved king who did not know the true and living God, the God of Nehemiah, he was willing to give Nehemiah paid vacation. You know, he gave him letters um, uh, so that he can procure uh, materials that is needed to build the walls. And also he sent escorts, uh, you know, to ensure uh, his safety and his uh, protections, Nehemiah's safety and and, uh, protection. So it was this unsaved king who God used, you know, uh, who God spoke to or God used to, you know, help in uh, fulfilling his plan and his purpose for his uh, people. And another example is the unsaved king, uh, King Cyrus, you know, who uh, when the 70 years of uh, 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 Babylonian captivity of the people of um, uh, Jerusalem had come to an end, you know, uh, Babylon was no longer ruled by the Babylonian kings, but was ruled by the Persian kings. And so we see that King Cyrus was ruling then during that end of that 70 year period, when that was the end of the punishment that God had pronounced for the people, uh, 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 for the people of Israel or the Jewish people, his people. And so we see that how God worked in the heart of King Cyrus and he allowed, um, uh, you know, uh, the Israelites uh, or the Hebrew people the Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their uh, city. So we can, we see here in through all of these um, uh, incidents that God can move through the governments, the rulers, those in authority, regardless of who they are. Now let's take this uh, principle and apply it to every other authority structure that you and I face in life, uh, whether it's the authority structure in the family that we saw, the local church, the body of Christ, or the workplace, you know, uh, uh, when we apply the same principle, uh, regardless of who is there, or regardless of what kind of people they are, if, you know, you and I relate rightly to the authority structure that God has placed, if you and I relate correctly to the people uh, in these authority structures, then you and I uh, will receive God's working in our lives because God is able to do it. Our responsibility is to give honor to whom honor is due, like we learned. Our responsibility is to recognize that God has allowed them to be in that place, in that position, in that rank uh, for whatever um, reason. Okay, so God's government comes into our lives through the authority structures that He has placed in uh, you and I, uh, that He has placed us in. Okay, and we are part of these uh, uh, these authority structures that He has placed, whether it's in the home. Uh, 
the family uh, or in the workplace in the uh, uh, in the in the local church in the body of christ or the civil government uh, 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 that we are under uh, you know all of these authority structures have been placed by god and if you and i learn to relate rightly to it you know we receive his kingdom uh, uh blessings we receive his kingdom coming into our lives and his government increases in and through us through each and uh, every authority structure that we are under okay and we uh, we find ourselves just releasing god's uh, blessing um, uh, releasing god's favor uh, and we can also experience god's favor and goodness even as we relate rightly uh, to these various authority structures and it works uh, for our good it works for our uh, betterment it works for our own peace and stability and for our own um, welfare but if we fail to follow god's authority structure you know it can have serious consequences um you know uh, just think about uh, you know if the civil government fails what happens to the state right what happens to the nation you know the same thing happens uh, will happen in the in the government structure in the family the home or uh, the workplace or the local church or the body of christ as um, well so we need to take it very seriously it's our responsibility because if uh, you know we uh, uh, you know uh, rightly uh, uh, place ourselves or adhere to the authority structures, do our part like we have seen in each of these authority structures. If we do our part, if we obey what God has, uh, the struct authority structures that God has placed in our lives, we take it seriously, uh, you know, and we do our responsibilities well in these uh, structures, then, you know, uh, people uh, who are under us or people who are with us you know they will rejoice if we do what is right you know people under us will be blessed for example if you are the uh, uh, the man of the house you're the head you know you uh, 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 align yourself and position yourself correctly uh, to doing uh, what god requires you to do in the authority structure uh, for example you know loving your wives just as christ loved the church you know uh, being the prophet priest and provider of the home you know uh, uh, loving your children uh, uh, nurturing them growing them in the things of the lord then when you do that that, you know when you do your responsibility well when we do our responsibility well in whatever uh, uh, authority structure that god has placed uh, in us we not only receive the ble blessings we not only receive the favor we not only see the goodness of god uh, the prosperity of god but also people who are under us will rejoice uh, people under us will be blessed and they would also want to follow the government of um, God, they would also want to come and be part of his kingdom uh, uh, and be part of the kingdom of God. They would become sons and daughters and they would also have the right um, framework, the right thinking, the right way of following, uh, you know, the, the authority structures that God has placed in their lives as well. But if we abuse uh, the uh, the structures that God has placed us in, authority structures that he's placed us in, then people will suffer and it, you know, it's not going to help us. It's not going to help our families. It's not going to help people who are connected with us. And we don't see the favor and the goodness of God as uh, well. Okay, so that is um, our chapter uh, nine for us. Okay, just basically be uh, looking at the various authority structures. We had stopped at uh, uh, you know uh, the civil government, and so I just wanted to finish that before we move on uh, to the next chapter. So we'll move on um, uh, to the next chapter, chapter 10, where we're going to talk about the literal kingdom. Okay. Uh, in all other chapters, we have been addressing, uh, you know, basically, uh, we have been talking about, uh, uh, you know, addressing the spiritual aspect of the kingdom of uh, God, right? I hope you'll remember that because, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, I was mentioning it from the very be beginning that uh, we are now in the spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God. So our focus of our study was basically the spiritual uh, kingdom of God and how we relate to it here and now. But in chapter 10, uh, we will just briefly explore some highlights about uh, foretelling, about the literal kingdom uh, that the Lord Jesus himself will establish on the earth at the beginning of the millennium, uh, his thousand year uh, rule and reign on the earth. And we will also look at, uh, uh, you know, the signs of this kingdom and various other aspects of this uh, kingdom. Okay. So that is what we will be looking at or studying in chapter 10. So um, as we studied, or as I also mentioned in, uh, you know, when we uh, began studying about the kingdom of God, uh, we looked and studied uh, chapter uh, uh, 25 of Matthew uh, verse 34. Um, it says, you know, God's original plan was to have a kingdom with the people who would be heirs with him in that kingdom on the Earth. So I hope you remember we we studied Matthew chapter twenty five verse thirty four in chapter one, uh, and we said that God's original plan was to have a kingdom, you know, uh, of people would be heirs with Him in that kingdom on the earth, and this is eventually, you know, uh, uh, what will happen. It will be the literal fulfillment when Christ Himself will come, uh, who is the King of the Kingdom, and He will usher in the physical kingdom here on. Uh, earth okay so let's uh, look at a few prophecies regarding uh, jesus being the king and ruling over the literal uh, kingdom okay so i like us to look at um, uh, genesis chapter 49 verse 10 um, it says the scepter shall not the scepter shall not depart from judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. So this prophecy clearly foretells the coming of a particular individual who is Jesus Christ. Now, in the Old Testament times, Shiloh was a city where the tabernacle was set up. We read this in Joshua chapter 18, verse 1. And this city was later destroyed. We read about this in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. Now, the ancient Jewish scholars explain that Shiloh was a word compounded from shell and lo, meaning to whom it belongs. Okay, so uh, therefore, you know, this sentence then, you know, when we read it, it reads like this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until the one comes to whom it belongs, because Shiloh means to whom it belongs. Uh, belongs. So Jesus came, you know, we know uh, of the royal tribe of Judah. We read this in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 14. And there is also an element of prophecy referring to Christ's second coming here. It says to him shall be the obedience of the people. Okay. So when he comes and rules the literal kingdom, the physical kingdom here on earth, you know, every P, all of them uh, who are there in that millennium kingdom, you know, uh, will live in total obedience to the king. Okay, so we look at a few prophecies of this literal kingdom that was foretold. Um, and, you know, the first uh, uh, prophecies uh, uh, that we will look at is what, uh, you know, God had covenanted to David. Okay, so the covenant that God had, the covenants that God had made with David, you know, uh, were prophecies also concerning the literal uh, kingdom. So we will look at a few of them. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 13 and verse 16, uh, it's called the Davidic covenant, you know, um, and God covenanted to David. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Okay. He says, your throne shall be established forever. Ever. 
So here, the context here is that God is speaking to the prophet Nathan, to David, and, you know, he's delivering a profound promise uh, regarding his dynasty. And it was David's desire to build a temple for God. And this desire is met with God's promise to establish David's house instead. Okay, that means David's house, I, I'm talking about a physical house, but lineage of kings uh, that were to follow him. Okay, so in verses 12 to 13, uh, uh, we see that, you know, the, the, the passage speaks of David's seed, his offspring. So initially, it refers here to Solomon, uh, who would, you know, take on the throne after uh, uh, his father, David, and who would build a physical temple in Jerusalem. But this prophecy goes beyond Solomon. It's pointing to a future king whose throne will be established forever, and that is Jesus Christ. Okay. So verse 16, it says, you know, um, God promises that David's throne will be established forever. Okay. So this is uh, critical for understanding the concept of the messianic kingdom uh, where Christ uh, you know, who is the son of David, will fulfill this everlasting kingship. While Solomon's kingdom had temporal influence, Jesus' reign is eternal, and it shows the fulfillment of this prophecy both in the physical and the spiritual realms. That means, you know, Jesus is the eternal king, uh, in the spiritual realms and also he is also the king uh, here on earth when he'll come and establish the thousand year millennium rule and he will continue to reign and rule as a king. Uh, another aspect of the covenant uh, that uh, we can see uh, uh, that was covenanted to David, uh, we read in Psalms chapter 132 uh, verse 11, it says the Lord has sown in truth David he will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your uh, body. Okay. So this psalm uh, reflects on God's promise to David, is reaffirming the promise of an eternal throne through uh, his descendants, through David's descendants. Okay. So God saw an oath or a promise that, uh, you know, a descendant of David would sit on his uh, throne forever. Uh, and this is seen as an unconditional promise, uh, showing God's commitment to fulfilling his covenant. That means, you know, there's nothing that is required on man's part to do anything to fulfill this covenant, but it's an unconditional promise where God himself is committing to fulfill uh, his covenant with David. And so he says, the fruit of your body here, it basically refers to physical uh, descendants, again, pointing to Jesus as the promised king who, who would, you know, inherit uh, this throne. Then we also read in Isaiah chapter 16, verse 5, uh, another covenant, you know, that was uh, 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 spoken to David uh, as covenanted to David um, in um in Isaiah chapter 16, verse 5, where it says, In mercy the throne will be established, and one will sit on it in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. So Isaiah is prophesying here about a future time when a righteous ruler will sit on David's throne, establishing justice and righteousness. Now, this prophecy points forward to a restored uh, kingdom where the true heir of David will reign. Okay. Now, what is the key point here? The key point here is in this, this prophecy basically speaks of a throne which will be established in mercy and truth with a ruler who just, uh, who, who would, uh, you know, judge uh, justly. And this aligns with the messianic kingdom where Jesus as a descendant of David will establish perfect justice and righteousness in his reign. Another, uh, uh, you know, covenant as co uh, that God come, made a covenant uh, with David. Uh, we read this in um, Jeremiah. Sorry. 
Uh, we read this in Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 to 18. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is a name by which she will be called the Lord our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, nor shall the priests, the Levites, lack a man to offer burnt offerings before me, to kindle grain offerings and to sacrifice continually. So here, Jeremiah is reaffirming God's promise to David, looking forward to a time when a branch of righteousness will come from David's lineage, and this ruler will bring justice, righteousness, and salvation, and it's specifically to Judah and uh, Jerusalem. Okay, so verses 14 to 16, uh, you know, this prophecy speaks of the Messiah, uh, Jesus as a branch of righteousness. And this is an important title uh, that refers to Jesus as a future king who will arise from David's line, who will bring about justice and righteousness. And this king will also be called as Lord our righteousness. So this is pointing uh, to Jesus's divine nature. Okay. And verses 17 to 18, God promises that there will always be a man from David's line to sit on the throne and the Levitical priest will continue to offer sacrifices. So this fulfillment of this is as seen in Jesus Christ, who is both king and priest, uh, like we read in Hebrews chapter 7. And how is he a priest? Because he offered himself as the full sufficient and the final sacrifice with uh, and with this sacrifice, God was pleased and which brought about our redemption and our uh, justification before God. Okay, so this is some of the prophecies that were con uh, made as a covenant to David. Uh, we will look at, uh, you know, the literal kingdom foretold as prophesied to Isaiah. Okay, so we looked at David, we look at uh, the literal kingdom that was foretold as prophesied by Isaiah. So we look at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and we are all very familiar with this uh, passage. This is a very well uh, known messianic prophecies. We read this during Christmas time. Uh, I think we also studied this in chapter 2 when we were talking about uh, uh, the king of the kingdom. And we looked at the various names and we tried to understand uh, uh, the names and how it applies to the kingdom and how it applies to us. So, you know, uh, this is one of uh, the well-known messianic prophecies and it's foretelling uh, the coming of a divine ruler who will establish an everlasting kingdom. Okay. And it says that the government will be upon his shoulders. Okay. So this indicates that the Messiah will bear the responsibility of, you know, ruling or reigning. He will rule and reign. Okay, the image of the government on his shoulders basically signifies his authority to rule uh, both spiritually and literally over all nations and over all peoples. And verse 7 it talks about an everlasting um, uh, kingdom. It says, you know, um, uh, out of, the, out of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it uh, uh, with uh, judgment and justice from this time forward and even forevermore. So it's talking about an everlasting kingdom. So it says of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So it refers to the eternal nature of Christ's kingdom and it says it will you know continuously expand and grow bringing peace without end and this peace is both personal it's a spiritual peace with God and also global where Christ returns to establish his physical reign okay 
and the phrase upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, you know, what does it mean? Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He is the promised king who would come from David's line and establish an eternal kingdom. Okay. This phrase to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. Uh, so Christ, what does that mean? It means that Christ's rule will be characterized by justice and righteousness, and he will bring perfect judgment, unlike human rulers who are often unjust or corrupt. And the phrase from that time forward, even forevermore, this points to the eternal reign of Christ. Once his kingdom is established, it will never end. Okay. And the last phrase in this uh, scripture passage in, in Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse uh, 7, it says that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will uh, perform this. So what does this mean? That, you know, God's own passion and determination will bring this prophecy to pass. It's not based on human effort, uh, but on God's sovereign will. Amen. So God, in his own passion, his own determination will bring this prophecy to pass. Okay. So we look at, uh, we looked at the literal kingdom as foretold uh, and covenanted to David uh, and to um, uh, Isaiah. And now we look at another person, uh, the literal kingdom uh, was foretold as uh, foretold by Daniel. Okay. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, we read that in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So in this passage, Daniel interprets uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which foretells the rise and fall of earthly uh, kingdoms. And this is followed by the establishment of an eternal kingdom. So the prophecy of an eternal kingdom, uh, we look at that here. So the, the phrase, uh, in the days of these kings, it basically uh, refers to the time of earthly kingdoms that Daniel had just described in the dream uh, and the statue that was representing various kingdoms, the kingdom of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And he says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Okay, So Daniel prophesies that God will establish his divine kingdom, which will be eternal and indestructible. And this is a direct prophecy of the kingdom of God brought about by Jesus uh, Christ. Okay, And the phrase, the kingdom shall not be left to other people. What does it mean? Like unlike earthly kingdoms, which are conquered or inherited by others, this kingdom, you know, which um, Daniel is prophesying about will not be passed on or destroyed. It will remain under God's rule forever. Okay. And the phrase, it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. This basically signifies that God's kingdom will supersede all the earthly kingdoms and that Christ's reign will ultimately overthrow all human rule and authority, okay? And the phrase, it shall stand forever, you know, talks about the eternal nature of God's kingdom, uh, which is emphasized here again, and Jesus' rule is everlasting, and he, uh, the fulfilling of the promises made to David and other prophets uh, will also be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Okay, so here we see the kingdom, uh, the literal kingdom, uh, foretold as covenanted to David, and uh, or spoken of by um, you know uh, uh, Isaiah, uh, and also by uh, Daniel. Okay, and so we saw the different aspects of the kingdom, and we saw how this kingdom is eternal in nature, how this kingdom supersedes all earthly kingdoms, and you know how Christ Himself will reign. Uh, and overthrow all human authority and um, rule, and it will remain, uh, this kingdom will remain for uh, ever because it's an eternal and indestructible uh, kingdom, okay? 
So uh, after all of these prophecies were made, you know, uh, we see that there was a temporary pause in the lineage of kings, uh, 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 you know, uh, in the lineage of uh, uh, King David. So we read in uh, Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 30, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out the heat of the day and the frost of the night. So we see that the lineage of the kings of Judah, there was a temporary pause when Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity. Okay, but that was not an end. Uh, we read in uh, the Gospels in Luke chapter 1 verses 30 to 33, the angelic announcement uh, where the angel comes and tells um, Mary, do not be afraid for Mary because you found favor with God and you will conceive in your womb and you will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus and he will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Amen. So the angel basically announced that Jesus was the one who would sit on the throne of David and rule forever in a kingdom that will have no end. And he introduced, you know, and we know that, you know, um, when, when Jesus came, he introduced a spiritual dimension of that eternal kingdom in his first king coming. And when he comes back again, he will come to fulfill it in its physical uh, dimension. Okay, so we see that, uh, you know, uh, even though there was a, a temporary pause in the lineage of kings in uh, David's line, but how Jesus was born and how there is a continuity of uh, um, uh, that lineage of kings as promised by God. Okay, so we will uh, now look at um, uh, Jesus' teaching on the literal kingdom. Okay, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12 says, Jesus says, And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into uh, outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus is saying here that many will come from the east and west, and they will sit down with Abraham. So what is he talking about here? He's, the fact here he's saying is that the Gentiles, you know, uh, uh, who had the faith to believe in Jesus, and because of their faith, you know, G it, it caused Jesus to announce that they would be also Gentiles who will be part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and they will sit down to dinner with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so this was a very radical idea in many of the Jewish people's mind in uh, Jesus' day because they thought, they assumed that this great messianic banquet would have no Gentiles and it will just be all Jews uh, uh, and it will just be Jews who will be there. But Jesus, you know, corrected uh, their, both their mistaken ide uh, ideas. So, you know, in the messianic banquet, there will not only only be Jews but there will also be Gentiles so we can all be encouraged we can all be happy that you know we too will be part of this messianic uh, banquet we too who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and are born again will also be part of this messianic uh, banquet so what else did Jesus uh, teach on the literal kingdom Matthew chapter 22 verses 1 to 15 you know, Jesus um, spoke uh, uh, another parable to them. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and went out uh, and he sent out his servants, you know, to call those who were invited for the wedding. But those who were invited did not come. Okay. Again, he sent out his servants saying, uh, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared a dinner. My oxen and fattened car cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But, you know, those who are invited uh, took it very lightly. They went their ways, one to his farm uh, to work, another to his business. And the rest seized uh, his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. 
But when the king heard about it, he was very furious. So he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. So those servants went out in the highways, they gathered together all who they found both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have, you know, the wedding garment, and he was speechless, you know. And the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot, cast him away, uh, you know, into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in this talk. Okay. Um, so here we see that, you know, uh, who is the uh, uh, king here? It is God. And it's the, talking about the wedding banquet. Okay. The, uh, uh, you know, and who are these people who are invited are the Jews. And, you know, uh, the Jews, you know, we know that God sent uh, prophets, he sent priests, he sent the judges, uh, people to, uh, you know, change them, correct them, but they did not obey, they did not, uh, you know, receive uh, the call, they did not receive the gospel. And so, you know, uh, and we know that, you know, um, some of the prophets, people, the Jews even killed um, and, you know, um, and then we see that, you know, uh, the, uh, the king whose God says, go and invite all the uh, Gentiles, you know, those in the highways, bring them. So here it's, it's indicating that there would be many others from the non-Jewish world, the Gentile world, who will be part of this eternal kingdom. And the very ones to whom the kingdom uh, will also be released on the um, earth, okay, um, uh, 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 you know, the very ones through whom the kingdom was to be released on the earth, that is the Jews, you know, uh, uh, because they rejected uh, the gospel, they rejected the Messiah, they rejected the Son of God, they rejected the truth that is in Jesus Christ, they would also be cast out into hell, okay? So uh, this is basically talking about how uh, the Jews had the privilege of uh, releasing the kingdom of God on, on earth. Uh, sorry, but how they rejected it. They rejected God. They rejected his son. And hence, you know, now the kingdom of God is extended to the Gentiles. All those Gentiles who believe in him, have faith in him, now will, uh, will also be part of the kingdom of God. Okay. Um, so we'll just look at a purview of the coming kingdom. What is the purview of the coming kingdom? Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. So during his earthly ministry, the Lord Jesus gave some of his disciples a purview. Uh, uh, what is uh, a purview? A purview is basically... Uh, a glimpse, uh, uh, you know, a, a promotion, a show, you know, um, uh, of the glory of his coming kingdom. Okay. So he prepared them by saying that some of them will not die until they saw the uh, power of the kingdom of God and the son of man in that uh, kingdom. Okay. So that is what uh, we uh, read in uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 1, uh, where it says, you know, that they will not taste death till they see the uh, kingdom of God coming or present with power. We read this also when Jesus uh, speaks in uh, Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 28, and Luke chapter 9, verse 27. He also tells them, you know, truly I tell you, uh, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Okay, so basically, um, you know, seeing uh, they were, uh, these people were able to see the power of the kingdom of God uh, as uh, manifested in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And they also saw the son of uh, God. 
Okay, and in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 8, we uh, see the whole uh, narrative of the transfiguration where Peter, James, and John, you know, were uh, led up to this high mountain and Jesus transfigured before them. Okay, so, uh, uh, so on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, uh, the disciples had a glimpse of what Jesus would look like in his glorious state uh, you know he was bright and radiant uh, similar to what uh, john describes in the book of revelation so this is like a purview a promo or a, 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 a foretaste of uh, what the kingdom of uh, uh, god that is coming uh, would be like okay and how jesus would uh, basically look in his glorified state okay also, uh, looking at the teachings of Jesus, Jesus spoke about the signs of the coming of the kingdom in Luke chapter 21, verses 27 to 32. Uh, we read that, you know, uh, that they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, uh, you know, with power and great glory. Um, now, these things begin to happen. Jesus says, you know, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Then he spoke to them a parable and he said, look at the fig tree and all the trees when they are all when they are already budding, you see and know for yourself that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. And he says, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. So in Luke chapter 21, he's basically talking about the signs of the uh, you know the uh, 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 that will happen the uh, the coming of the kingdom of the literal kingdom of uh, God before the millennium rule, and so the uh, Lord Jesus is basically describing the end time and the signs that will happen and the period that is just bef the, before his uh, coming uh, when he will come to set up the literal kingdom here on earth, and he. Uh, he mentions the signs that will happen and he says that all of this will happen in one generation okay and the same generation uh, will see the coming of the kingdom of god so one generation will see the signs and uh, you know he says just like you know when you look at a fig tree or all other trees when it's budding we we know what season is going to come what season is going to come it's going to uh, you know summer is going to come so he's saying just like this like i've narrated all of these uh, signs that will happen uh, before I come back the second time to establish the literal kingdom. He says, you know, all of those signs will happen in one generation and that same generation will see the coming of God. Okay. So um, uh, we, we know that uh, Jesus is um, uh, the king who came Okay, and how do we know that he was the king who was born here on this earth? Uh, like we saw what, uh, you know, uh, the angel tells um, um, Mary in Luke chapter 1 verses 32, uh, 33. Okay, um, we know that uh, Jesus was that Messiah who was prophesied in the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, we see, you know, a prophecy that was said in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, uh, where we see a powerful prophetic an uh, announcement regarding the coming king, where Zechariah says, you know, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you, he's just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay, so these verses basically highlight two important aspects of the king, his humility and his mission. So the imagery of Jesus riding on a donkey, we know that Jesus, when he uh, entered Jerusalem, he rode on a donkey. Uh, we read this in uh, Mark chapter 11. Okay, and so it basically signifies peace and humility, and it is a sharp contrast 
to what the people were expecting that you know the messiah would come who would be king who would rule uh, you know uh, and he would be like this warlike ruler would be triumphant um, but when we look at the new testament you know and we read uh, uh, you know, we see this prophecy fulfilled, like I said, in uh, in uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 10, where it says, Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Okay. Uh, it says here that the people are acknowledging the arrival of this promise uh, king and his kingdom which is associated with the lineage of uh, David and they're celebrating Jesus as that fulfillment of that promise but however you know this moment also represents a significant contrast to what many anticipated okay they were expecting someone who was a mighty leader who would deliver them from the roman rule roman oppression and yet the reality was this king was who was arriving you know who came he came in a humble manner riding on a donkey okay so jesus who was to be king of the jews and ultimately the king of this whole world he had a mission that, you know, basically transcends all earthly expectation. Uh, his mission was not to establish an immediate political kingdom, but to, you know, fulfill the redemptive work that was necessary for all mankind when he came in his um, you know, the first uh, time when he came on the earth, you know, this was uh, more about uh, him, uh, uh, you know, doing the redemptive work than establishing a literal kingdom. Uh, but it was more about establishing a spiritual aspect of the kingdom and creating a way for people to uh, be part of that uh, kingdom. So only after fulfilling his mission of redemption, you know, could he gather all the people who would uh, not only inherit uh, this kingdom, but also administer this kingdom here on uh, earth. So we know that, you know, the people who accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, uh, who part of his spiritual kingdom, they will also come along with him when he comes the second time. And, you know, they will also inherit uh, the kingdom that he will establish, the physical literal kingdom that he will establish here on the uh, earth. And it will be a kingdom which is characterized by the rule of Christ, uh, you know, and uh, it, his rule will be eternal. Okay. So we look at a few more things that uh, 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 Jesus speaks about this literal kingdom. We'll take a break and come back after the break and continue. Thank you, everyone.